think we're all here, right? Uh, welcome, everybody. This is uh, a special occasion of the New York City Category 3 Seminar. And I'm very pleased to uh, introduce uh, a man of eclectic interests, I would say, uh, now includes homotopy type theory. Uh, so please welcome Andre Joyal. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to be speaking at this uh, category seminar. I feel a little bit like of nostalgia because uh, there was a category seminar like this one uh, some 30, 40 years ago. It was organized by Sammy Allenberg, Alex Eller, and uh, Mai Sierney. And uh, <clears throat> Uh, I think there is a connection, actually, between this seminar and the seminar of 30 years ago, because uh, uh, Nusov uh, Janowski is actually a student of uh, Alex Heller. So there is a direct connection between the two. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, you may find the title of my talk a bit... Uh, uh, Strange in the sense that I say a new connection between logic, category theory, and topology. Actually, uh, this connection is at least 10 years old uh, because it was uh, discovered uh, by independently by um, Vladimir Voivodsky and uh, uh, Stephen Awodi and Michael Warren. Uh, about 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more, in 2006, something like this, maybe 2005. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I, I think it's still a new connection, although it's 10 or 12 years old, because uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a new idea in mathematics in the sense that uh, it has not been yet completely uh, explored. Maybe ideas in mathematics have a life of their own. You know, they are born at a certain date, and then they grow, and then they come to maturity, and after a while, they uh, give a lot of uh, uh, nice consequences, and eventually, I don't know, maybe they never completely die, because that's mathematics, and even Euclidean geometry is still alive today, in some sense. And I w would guess that uh, multiple type theory is an idea like that. It's uh, it is still in its infancy. You know, if you if you think of the life of a person, ten years old, is still still a child, right? And so, uh, I'm very interested, and I think uh, we should be uh, look at this. Uh, just touch you the, to touch it. Just went that's asleep. It just went asleep. That's all. Oh, okay. Hopefully. Okay. There you go. <laughs> uh, um, the the homotopy type theory is connecting uh, three uh, subjects, three fields of mathematics, and uh, there is a potential of uh, uh, having important consequences in these uh, three fields of mathematics. Uh, it already has. Uh, uh, quite uh, a bit of, uh, there, there are many, uh, I would say, new results or new ideas coming from, from it since uh, during the last uh, decade. And I would like to uh, describe uh, the subject first, uh, but maybe I will remind you, uh, it's good to start with a reminder of the classical connections between logic, algebra, and topology. Uh, I wrote algebra instead of category theory because algebra is somehow older than category theory. Boolean algebra uh, were around since quite some time, in some sense since uh, George Boole. Hating algebra are much, uh, uh, are much less older. Uh, in the 30s, I think, uh, they were created by Hating, a student of Brouwer. Uh, cylindric algebra 
uh, that's uh, creations of Tusky, I think. Uh, um, they uh, formalize first order logic uh, a bit like uh, Boron algebra are formalizing propositional logic. <coughs> And uh, there are there is something called categorical doctrines, which were first uh, introduced by Bill of Year. There are various kinds of categorical doctrines. I will not uh, define what is a categorical doctrine here, although uh, many of the things that I'm saying is influenced by the idea of a categorical doctrine. Uh, there is a a well-known connection between Cartesian closed categories and lambda calculus, uh, uh, which uh, was maybe discovered by Lovier too. First, uh, Lovier, I think, was aware of uh, Cartesian closed categories were really formalized in some way, or uh, the importance of Cartesian closed categories for logic was uh, stressed by uh, Lovier. And I think we should add also autonomous categories, which are some kind of uh, symmetric monadal categories with duality and something called linear logic. And there is more. Oh, yeah, just touch the. And there is. There is more because. Uh, since uh, the notions of elementary topos was uh, discovered by uh, Lovier and Tierney, uh, it had a lot of influence on categorical logic and the applications. So I think the theory of frames and locales is a part of the, of the theory of topos and elementary toposes. And there's a connection with the intuitionist set theory uh, Grotesk toposes and geometric logic, and I should say reality topos. And uh, this list is probably uh, too short. Uh, there are other things that could be added. Um, okay, so these have a classical connection. Uh, but uh, I would like you to read this uh, sentence of, of Whitehead, uh, 1950, in a paper called Algebraic Homotopy Theory, I think. Uh, it's in the collected work of Whitehead. And it's quite uh, striking. Uh, so he said that the ultimate aim of algebraic homotopy is to construct a purely algebraic theory, which is equivalent to homotopy theory in the same sort of way that analytic is equivalent to pure projective geometry. Uh, <clears throat> in some sense, uh, homotopy theory nowadays uh, <coughs> is uh, some kind of uh, analytic homotopy theory. So you somehow constantly work with coordinate and um, it's a problem of finding an axiomatic uh, descriptions of what homotopy theory is. There are some there are some kind of axiomatic system in homotopy the theory. Uh, there are three of them here. Listed triangulated categories uh, are one, homotypical algebra or model categories, and there is also the notion of derivators. Uh, there are new axiomatic systems uh, since uh, the last uh, 15 years. Uh, maybe it's 15, 20 years, new axiomatic, new approach to multiple theory have been proposed. Uh, there is uh, the, the notions of uh, higher topos by Charles Reck, uh, Jacob Lurie, and uh, also Bertrand Toen and uh, Vizuzzi. Uh, in the case of Toen and Fetzosi, they were more oriented toward the application to uh, algebraic geometry, while Lurie is, uh, uh, has developed uh, the theory of uh, so-called infinity topos quite abstractly. Uh, and uh, now, and this is the subject of my talk today, homotopy type theory. Wojewski, Woody, and Warren. 
And uh, there is a variation of what uh, uh, the classical type theory is called cubical type theory by Coca and collaborators. So this is something I uh, will uh, discuss about. Okay, and there is uh, this uh, Wojewski Univalent uh, Foundation program, um, uh, which was uh, um, described uh, in 2000, well, maybe before that, but there was a meeting at the Institute for, for Advanced Study uh, some uh, five years ago already. Uh, on this subject, and uh, an important uh, idea is something is something called univalence, uh, Voivodsky univalence principle, and this is a very important uh, principle, which is to type theory what the induction principle is to piano arithmetic. Uh, the univalence principle is also called the equivalence principle by uh, Thierry Coquin and some other. So it has maybe different names, but uh, it is maybe one of the main, maybe the main contributions of uh, Wojewodski to homotopy type theory. And uh, a univalent type theory is obtained by adding the univalence principle to Martin Love type theory. And the goal <coughs> of the uh, Univalent Foundation program uh, is to give a constructive to give constructive mathematics a new foundation. That's one goal. Apply type theory to homotopy theory. That's another goal. And a third one, which is uh, uh, very important, but uh, unfortunately I will say nothing about it, which is b by lack of competence. Uh, to develop proof assistant based on univalent type theory. Uh, this was uh, a very important aspect of uh, the Pro Wojewodski program because uh, uh, he wanted uh, to give people uh, some kind of uh, uh, concrete tool for doing mathematics uh, and uh, that could revolutionize in some way the way we do mathematics because we would be able to uh, write uh, proof on a computer uh, and uh, uh, possibly write papers in the same way and if uh, the proof would be automatically uh, checked or verified by the, uh, by the system by the proof assistant, and therefore a referee uh, will not need to check if the result is proved or not. I mean, you would submit a paper uh, with the proof and the verification, and uh, the referee, uh, the job of the referee will not be to check if the proof is correct, because this is checked. So his job would be to uh, decide if the result is interesting or not, which is in some sense a more a better uh, uh, kind of things to do in many ways. Uh, that could revolutionize really mathematics because uh, by speeding up the uh, uh, publication uh, process uh, and, um, um, in many ways, yeah. Okay, and now um, the goal of my talk will be to describe the connection between type theory, category theory, and topology by using the notions of tribe. Uh, I will define what is a tribe in a moment, but before, it's, it's a categorical notion. A tribe is a category equipped with a class of maps called fabrication. And uh, the reason it is in, it may be natural to talk about tribes uh, when we discuss type theory is that uh, the syntactic 
taxic category of type theory is a tribe. Uh, given a logical system, very often you can construct, you can associate to it a category where the objects are sort of the formulas and the maps are the map that can be defined logically in the system. And uh, you say that two maps are equal if they are provably equal in the system. So you get a category which is called the syntactic category of, uh, of the logical system. In the case of uh, type theory, uh, this uh, syntactic category has the structure of a tribe. I will define what is a tribe uh, in a moment. But uh, the point is that the notion of tribe is a gateway to type theory because we may work backward. Uh, if I tell you what is a tribe, uh, it's kind of uh, easy to uh, tell you what is type theory, at, at least intuitively. So uh, the notions of tribe is rather easy to understand because it's uh, very uh, it's very close to standard uh, categorical notion, and then we can uh, from it we can describe many aspects of type theory. So. Um, I'm going to take this approach of uh, describing tribes and then try to tell you what is uh, uh, type theory at the same time. And uh, I hope then that you will feel comfortable uh, with uh, type theory because this is close, very close to something you already know. And in some sense, uh, every mathematician is already familiar with type theory. You're using it, but you don't know that you are using it. Okay, so the overview it will be what is a tribe, what is type theory, what is univalence, what is descent, what is an elementary aerotropos applications. That uh, will be six part. To um, define what is a tribe, I need the notions of catable map uh, in the category. So if you have a map P in the category C, the map is said to be catable uh, if uh, it has a fiber product with any other map F from A to B. Uh, I think that this notion was, uh, the terminology was introduced by Grothendieck uh, in his work, maybe in SGA4, I don't know exactly. But uh, we will often use uh, what is called base change. So if you have a catalog map P and F a map from A to B, if you take the uh, fabric product, uh, you have a projection, pi 1 and pi 2, and pi 1 is called the base change of P along F. So um, the base change is like this way. You are sort of pulling back P along F, and you get pi 1. OK. Before defining the notions of tribe, it's good to introduce the notions of clan. Uh, so a clan is a category with terminal object. You need a terminal object equipped with a class F of catable maps called fabrations satisfying the following uh, condition. First, uh, every isomorphism is a fabrication. The composite of two fabrations is a fabrication. The base change of a fabrication along any map is a fabrication. So in the square before, if P is a fabrication, then pi 1 is a fabrication. And also the unit map from an object X to the terminal uh, object is a fabrication for every object X. Okay, so uh, that's an intermediate notion. Uh, at the next page, I will, the next two pages, I will introduce the notions of tribe. But uh, so this clan is just a category with a class of, ma of fabrication, which satisfying sort of uh, very normal, obvious axioms. And uh, 
with this notion, there's also a notion of homomorphisms of cloud. So an homomorphism between two clouds is a functor uh, f uh, from c to c prime, which preserves fabrication and base change of fabrication. Now, to, to preserve base change of fabrication, it just means that if you uh, take the base change of a fabrication p along a map f, then you have a square. Uh, and the functor f is going to take this uh, fiber product into a fiber product, uh, this uh, base change square into a base change square again. So this is what it means. And in addition, it preserves terminal objects. OK. Now, if you have a clown, you can introduce a, a notion of anodyne maps uh, in uh, any clown. And this is uh, very much like uh, if you are familiar with the notion of a model category, the anodyne maps are like uh, sometimes called the trivial cofabration. They are the maps having the uh, left lifting property with respect to every fabrication. So a map U is anodyne if for every fabrication F and every commutative square, uh, the square is a diagonal filler called D. Now, uh, to be a diagonal filler means it's a map from B to X such that the two triangles commute. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with uh, the notions of model category. If you are familiar, this notion will make sense, and you will say, yes, I recognize it's an, it's an important thing. But if I'm not familiar, it's very weird. Because I remember the first time I saw, uh, I was reading the book of Quillen, Homotypical uh, Algebra, and he had a list of axioms about uh, what he called the model category, where you could do a multiple theory. So it's really an axiomatic system. Uh, uh, I will have to explain in which sense uh, type theory is uh, producing a better axiomatic system. The, the axiomatic uh, system of uh, Quillen, the notions of model category, is a very, very general. It's kind of too general. It, it, any kind of homotopy theory, or almost, is, uh, is, is producing a Quillen model category. Uh, so it's a bit like the notions of category is very general, you know. A category, there are so many categories. You know, yeah. It's very, very general. It's, it's, it's very useful because it's very general. But at the same time, uh, what is really important, for example, is the category of set. I mean, the category of set is very basic among all categories. And uh, we would like to understand the properties of the category of sets, in addition to knowing something about every category. And uh, this is what's happening with the multiple type theory. Multiple type theory is like uh, uh, giving a focus on the category of space, the multiple theory of spaces. Okay. Quillen is just giving you something general about any kind of homotopy theory. And it's so general, it's very useful, but uh, you cannot prove basic things about spaces just from the Quillen axioms. You need something more. And, uh, um, but, uh, so, but still, uh, you have these uh, funny axioms that uh, I'm introducing here. The, uh, people in the multiple type theory do not have an axiom like this. They have another kind of funny axiom called the J rule, okay? Which is all, also a little bit uh, difficult to understand. So I hope you will accept the axiom so, as it is, and uh, then you see what are the consequences. And, uh, Okay, so uh, this defines the notions of anodyne map. <coughs> uh, 
Uh, and now let's go to the notions of tribe. Okay. So, a tribe is a clan satisfying some extra property. So, first, the base change of an anodyne map along a fabrication is anodyne. So, if you have a vertical map which is anodyne, you, take the, you put it back along a fabrication, something that you can do because a fabrication is scalable. Mm -hmm. And then you get, again, uh, an anodyne map. So, that's the first axiom. And the other one is that uh, every map admits uh, factorization as an anodyne map followed by a fabrication. Well, uh, this is uh, almost copied from uh, the Quillen model structure, the idea that you can always uh, factor a map as a trivial cofabrication followed by a fabrication. Okay, so nothing very um, interesting for a moment, uh, but that's the notions of tribe. That's uh, a category equipped with uh, a class of maps called fabrations, and then you, you put some axioms on this class of map. Okay, uh, it's good to have the notions of homomorphisms of tribe. It's an homomorphism of clans which take anodyne maps to anodyne maps. So, um, that's the definition. Okay, so an example is a tribe of CAN complexes. <coughs> so, a CAN complex is a simplicial set of a certain kind, satisfying uh, a condition uh, and uh, uh, it's called a filling condition. Here I'm defining uh, the notions of can fabrication before defining the notions of can complex. So a map of simplicial set is a can fabrication uh, if uh, any commutative square like this has a diagonal filler. Now here uh, in this uh, lambda kn, lambda kn. Uh, you, I want to explain the notation because uh, uh, if I explain the notations, you will remember its meaning. Uh, delta n here is a, is a simplex of dimension n. So there are n plus 1 vertices, and it's the converse all of uh, n plus 1 uh, independent vertices. Well, lambda kn is... Uh, the boundary of, uh, of the simplex, and then you remove the face of the boundary, which is opposite to vertex k. Okay, opposite to vertex k. So this is just a notation, but uh, uh, you see lambda is like a simplex with a face which has been removed, <laughs> and you see the k, which is an exponent, is just a numbering of the k simplex. And so the face opposite to the k simplex has been removed. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then there is an inclusion of lambda kn into delta, and that's the vertical maps. And uh, to be a confabration means that each time you have such a square, uh, you, you can fill uh, the square with a diagonal. Uh, this was introduced uh, by the notions of uh, Kahn fabrication. I think was not introduced by Kahn. The notion of Kahn complex was introduced by Kahn, but not the notions of Kahn fabrication. Uh, it was Gabriel and Zisman, I think, who were the first to introduce uh, Kahn fabrations. Okay, and uh, in particular, you see that. Uh, a simplicial set is a count complex if the map from x to 1 is a count fabrication. I'm s normally, I don't define count complexes like this. I define compl count complex directly. I don't define it as a special mm -hmm. case of a count fabrication. But uh, I wanted to uh, write things uh, short. So mm -hmm. I, sorry about that. The mathematicians have this... Uh, 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 tendency of uh, compressing their definition uh, 
thinking that uh, they become very clear when they are very compressed. <laughs> <laughs> and we all know it's not true. You know? so, <laughs> so I'm sorry, I, I did that here because uh, I have defined the notions of kind of complex as a special case of a kind of vibration compressing. Mm -hmm. The two definitions is somehow in one. And uh, it takes less space, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, the um, category of uh, can complexes, this is a full subcategory of uh, uh, the category of saint pisa set. Uh, it's a tribe uh, where a fabrication is a can fabrication. Okay. So these are classical examples. Okay. That's a theorem. Yeah. Uh, I call it a theorem, but really, given what is known, right, it's just uh, obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's somehow Gabriel and Zisman somehow, but they didn't know what is a tribe, but it doesn't matter. Now, uh, a remark is that a map between can complexes is uh, anodyne uh, if and only if it is a strong deformation retract. If you know what is a strong deformation of the track, uh, it may help you to understand what is uh, an underlying map. But um, otherwise, uh, it means that U is, is monic. So A is a sub set of B. And then uh, there is a map backward. And um, this <coughs> map backward from B to A is uh, a multiple equivalence and uh, with some condition, this is called a strong deformation retract. Okay. Okay, now that uh, I told you what is a, a, a tribe, I can tell you what is type theory in some sense. <coughs> so suppose that you have a tribe, then you may see that an object uh, in the tribe is a type. Rather than saying that it's an object, you change the terminology. Okay, this is the first step in type theory, right? <laughs> you can change the terminology. You don't call an object in a tribe an object anymore, you call it a type. And you have this notation, this uh, a bit of funny notation, it's called a turnstile, I think. Uh, and, and I will say more about this notation later. Uh, but uh, this notation is saying that uh, A is an object in a certain tribe. The tribe is not specified, but you have to have one in mind. And there is another notation for a map from the terminal object to A. Uh, such a map is called an element of type A. So. It's like an element in a set in some sense. You may think of a type as a set, and a map from the singleton to A is an element uh, of, this, of this set A. Uh, except that type theorists are going to use this notation to say that uh, a small A is uh, an element of capital A, of the type A. Uh, but type theorists often call an element of type A a term of type A. They call it a term because they look at it from a syntactic point of view. They see the formulas and the symbols and etc. And some of these uh, formulas are called term. Okay. Uh, Martin Love told me that this is wrong. Martin Love, the inventor of uh, modern type theory. Mm -hmm. It should be called an element. In set theory, when you work with set theory, you don't call an element of a set a term of this set, okay? Why would you mm -hmm. say that? You call it an element, right? But uh, uh, most type theorists, uh, now they are calling an element of type A a term. So there is nothing uh, absolutely wrong with call it a term. You can call it a term if you like, okay? <coughs> okay, so this is the first step in type theory. Just a change of terminology and notation. Okay. Now, uh, suppose that you have a tribe E, then you can construct another tribe, uh, 
which uh, I write E comma A, given an object A of, uh, of this tribe, you can construct a new tribe. And this new tribe is a full subcategory of uh, the slice category E over A. You see, E over A is called the slice category of object over A. An object there in E over A uh, is a map, uh, let's say, from X to A. A map P, a pair XP, a map from X, uh, X to A. Uh, and uh, but uh, this map may or may not be a fabrication. So uh, you take the full subcategory of the slice category whose objects are fabrication. So you, you restrict to the object over A uh, defined by fabrications with target A. Okay. Okay. Now this is a tribe again. Well. Uh, if it is a tribe, we need to know what are the fabrations. Well, uh, a map in EA is a fabrication. You see, a map in EA is just a map like from, from X to Y, such that the square, the triangles commute. And a map is a fabrication if F itself is a fabrication in E. Okay. okay. In uh, this is again not surprising at all. You can check it. It's kind of an easy exercise to check that. So, given a tribe, you can construct a new tribe. Now, we are going to interpret the object of this new tribe. Okay. Suppose that P is a fabrication, then it gives you an object E, P of the tribe EA. And this uh, object is called a dependent type in context A. This is the terminology of type theories. Now, a, a type theorist will write this formula here. Uh, which is, which I'm going to try to read somehow. It says that for every element <coughs> X of A, I have a type EX, which is the Depending, depending on, on the element x. So, but e x actually is not e. It is denoting the fiber of uh, the fabrication along the element x. So, what happens is that if you have a fabrication p, you can pull it back. You can take a base change along element of a. This is this uh, element x uh, is an element of a. It's a map from one, from one to a. And what you get is the fiber of the fabrication at the at, the, at point x at the point x. And you get a family of fibers. I mean, if x varies, if x is a variable element of a, you have a family of fibers. And you would like to regard the fabrication as a family, a family of object, the family of fibers, indexed by a point of, of the base. Okay, so this is the point of view of that theorist. Uh, as opposed to the point of view of a category theorist, uh, if I using tribes, for a type theorist, a fabrication is really a family of objects. It's a family. So, <clears throat> what this means is that uh, in a tribe, not only that you have objects of the tribe, but you have also Families, it's called internal families of objects. Which are internal families of objects. Uh, they are not uh, external families in the sense that they've given two objects, uh, A1, A2, A3. I can define a family indexed by 1, 2, 3. There are three objects. This would be an external family. 
An internal family is a family defined in this way. By taking the fibers of a fabrication, uh, and this, now I can explain why I call a tribe a tribe, why I choose tribe as a name. Maybe there are other names for the notions of tribe, but um, uh, for uh, anthropologists, uh, a, a, a tribe is a collection of families having interacting and uh, that uh, transform from one generation to the other. <laughs> and uh, so I thought that it would be uh, good to uh, give a name uh, of this kind because the theory of tribes is really the theory of families mm -hmm. as opposed to a theory of objects. It, we are more concerned with families than with objects. Well, not exactly. You cannot ignore the object also. There are operations on families and objects. Uh, okay. So, for example, if you have a fabrication P and a section of this uh, fabrication, let's call it S. So a section is a map from A to E, uh, so that PS is the identity of A. So it's a, a right inverse of P. P followed, uh, uh, S followed by P is the identity of A. So it is a left inverse of P. So. Okay, so if you have sections of a fabrication, then by evaluating the section at an element X, you get a value, Sx, which is in the fiber of x, the fibers of p at the point x. Okay? So you get a family of uh, elements of ex, but the family is indexed by x. So a tat theorist would write something like this. And, uh, he is going to call this thing here the context of, uh, of this formula. This formula is called a judgment, actually. And uh, um, a section of a fabrication is, is defined as a family of elements, which is indexed by elements of A. So, um, that's it. That's the notion of uh, section relative to the notions of elements. Okay. So if you look at the functor from E to EA, defined by putting E of X is you actually you're pulling back X along the projection from A to 1. So there's a projection from A to 1. And uh, you can think at, at an object X as sitting over the terminal object. So you're taking the fiber product between A and X, and there is a projection uh, pi 1. And uh, uh, you get a functor, which is really just a base change functor along the, the map from A to 1. Uh, that's an homomorphism of tribe. And in type theory, uh, this corresponds to uh, an operation called context extension. So this means that if you have a type B, so this is an object in E, and then you uh, can extend the context in which this object is defined by just adding on the left-hand side this parameter. This is a bit like saying, OK, I have an object B, which is independent of, of the variable x. But if I want, I may regard the object B as dependent on the element x, although B is constant. It's like a constant family indexed by an element of A. Okay? So the passage from uh, uh, an object B to a constant family 
is called a context extension. And uh, the, the operation is, uh, is uh, illustrated by this bar, this horizontal bar. This is like a deduction rule. Uh, if you have these formulas, then you can write this one too, which is also uh, well-formed formulas. Same thing for uh, elements. If you have an element T of B, you will be able to uh, uh, regard it as a variable element, which is actually constant in a constant uh, object B. Okay? Context extension again. Well, these two operations here correspond to this functor from the tribe E to EA. Okay? That's uh, really the f um, formal type theoretic uh, description of this functor. In particular, a map between two types. How do you describe a map in type theory? You could describe a map between two types in this way. It's a, a family of elements of B indexed by a variable element of A, okay? Which is somehow something we do all the time in mathematics, you know? If you want to describe a map between two sets, for example, uh, you need to have some kind of formulas that describe an, an element of B, F is the formulas, in terms of an element of A, okay? <coughs> Okay, this is a very kind of simple. Um, more generally, if you have a map uh, in a tribe, uh, then the base change functor is an homomorphism of tribe. The base change functor is pulling back an object over B to an object over A, pulling back along F. Okay, this is called a base change functor. Well, that's an homomorphism of tribe. And this corresponds to this uh, uh, deduction rule in type theory. Uh, if you take an object in E of B, so what is it? You have a family of uh, objects indexed by elements of B, okay? Yeah. Call them E of Y. And then you put Y equal to F of X. You replace Y by F of X. Okay, and what will happen is that you will be able to get a family of object of, um, of B again, but indexed by A. Uh, and that's the formula. This is something we do somehow all the time. It's a replacement. You replace the variable Y by F of X and you have a re-indexing of the family. Totally uh, standard in mathematics. Same thing for um, a family of elements. Okay. Now we come to more interesting operation. Uh, in type theory, you have a sum operation, and the sum operation is a summation operation. Is taking a family and taking you, a family of of uh, object, and you take the disjoint union of this family and getting a new object. So uh, this is what I'm doing uh, at this, uh, there, up there. I take a family of uh, uh, object of a family of types indexed by the element of, of the type A. And now if I take the sum uh, of, uh, which is kind of disjoint union, I will get a new type, which is uh, indexed by nothing now. You sort of lose the indexing when you're taking sum. It's a bit like uh, uh, when you take an integral, uh, the, vari the, the variable x become binded. You see, There's a, the variable x was not binded before, but after taking the summation, uh, the variable x uh, kind of disappeared from the formulas. Uh, and well, this is just uh, a very uh, trivial operation in some sense in category theory, because uh, uh, the family that you started with is described by a map, let's say, 
P from E to A, the vibrations P from E to A. And what are we doing? Well, um, the domain of this vibration is exactly what you call summation uh, x over a of ex. So this operation is taking a map of vibrations from, let's say, from e to a, and you forget the codomain and you just look at the domain of this vibration, which is really the sum of all the fibers of the vibrations. So. Okay, more generally, you can um, uh, uh, take a summation with some kind of uh, restriction. You can, uh, if f is a vibration from A to B, you would be able to uh, do a similar operation. Uh, but this time, uh, the variable x is not entirely binded uh, because uh, a of y here is the fiber of f at an element y of b so this is the notation for the fiber of the map f at y uh, okay now we come to uh, an even more interesting operation which is called the internal product the summation was a left edge went to a base change functor, and the product will be the right adjoint to the base change functor. Uh, the left adjoint always exists in a tribe, but the right adjoint does not always exist. And when it exists, it's called, it's said the tribe is said to have internal products. So to have internal product is a condition on the tribe. Not every tribe has an internal product. But it, um, the product is actually completely determined by uh, the base change functor because the right edge right of functor of a functor is unique up to unique uh, as a morphism, and therefore, actually, to have internal product is actually a condition on the tribe. It's not an extra structure; it's a condition because the right edge right is unique when it exists. And uh, there are two conditions on the right adjoint. Uh, the functor pi f uh, should take anodyne maps to anodyne maps. And also uh, something called the beck chevalier conditions all. That's a bit of a mysterious condition. But the fact is that uh, it's... Uh, what it means is that taking product and taking base change commutes. So uh, uh, you don't need to think uh, a lot about this condition because this is really just a commutation law in some sense between changing parameter, base change is changing the parameter, and taking product. So let's not uh, uh, discuss it uh, too long. But it's important that the tribe of Kant complexes <coughs> has internal product. Okay, now in particular, uh, the internal product is uh, quite important in the case where the base change functor is the functor E that I have described before, which is uh, pulling back along the map from A to 1. It's a pulling back functor. This functor uh, is a special case of a base change along a vibration, the functor E. And uh, it has a right edge one if you have internal product. And this right edge one has the following interpretation. That if you start with a family of types indexed by A, so this is uh, the uh, judgment uh, above the line, the horizontal line family of type indexed by A, then you can take the uh, product of this family indexed by the variable x, and you get a new type. Okay? And that's the operations of product, which is described above. Okay? Uh, and of course, in mathematics, we use product all the time. We use sum and product. And, uh, 
So uh, in a tribe uh, with uh, internal products, these operations are there. In particular, you can uh, do the product of uh, type B uh, regarded as a constant family. So the product of A copies of B. So this is a product indexed by elements of A. And if you do that, you get uh, the uh, type of functions from A to B. An element of uh, this type is really a map from A to B. So you have a way to consider function spaces in, uh, in type theory. OK. Now I come to pad objects. If you have an object in a tribe, uh, I define, you can define what is a path object for A. So uh, this is, uh, in principle, if you think of, of the object A as a space, PA is another space. It's the space of all paths. Uh, let's say indexed by the interval 0, 1, if you like, in A. So all paths in A. And um, a path as a source and a target. This is why you have this map ST here. You have, uh, for each path, you have two points in A, the source and the target. And um, also, there is the constant path uh, uh, between two points, which does not move. And this is called, this is the map R here. Uh, the map R takes uh, points of A and associates to it the constant path equal to the points. And uh, what you get here is a factorization of the diagonal uh, of A uh, as, uh, as a map R followed by uh, ST. And uh, in any tribe, you can def define this factorization. You can construct this factorization, but pretty much like in the model category, where <coughs> you can also define a path object or an object A in the same way. You factor the map as a homotopy equivalence followed by a fabrication. Okay. Well, it's quite miraculous that the notions of that object can be captured in this abstract way. Uh, it's an amazing thing. I, you get used to it when you are, when you know it, you know, you, when you know it and use it. But uh, the idea that the space of paths is kind of uh, characterized by this sort of abstract axiom is a marvelous uh, thing. Well, the factorization is not unique because uh, uh, there are many kinds of paths that you can imagine depending uh, on the interval that you choose. You could have a sort of thicker interval between two points than just the usual interval. So uh, the path space is not unique, but um, uh, it happens to be homotopy unique, but anyway. Using the path space, you, def you can define what is a homotopy between two maps. It's just the way Quillen uh, did. And the homotopy between two maps from A to B is a map H from A into the path space, such that the source of H is F and the target of H is G. That's a uh, homotopy. Now, it's not difficult to prove that in a tribe, this relation is a congruence on the arrows of E. Uh, the notions of homotopy depends on the choice of the path space, but actually the homotopy relation is independent of the path space. You could uh, define the homotopy relation using another path space because there are many of them, but the homotopy relation would be the same. Okay. And now, once you have uh, a tribe, 
and the homotopy relation, you can construct the homotopy category. The homotopy relation is a congruence on the category, and uh, it's a, an equivalence relation which is compatible with compositions, and you can define the homotopy category. And you can then define what is an homotopy equivalence. It's a map which is invertible in the homotopy category. And you can show that every anodyne map is homotopy equivalent. And you can show that, well, not that you can show, but you can define a contractible object, which is an important notion. An object is contractible if the map from X to 1 is a homotopy equivalent. So this is like uh, uh, something in the homotopy theory of tribes. You see, this is very much like in a quillen model category. Okay, now let's go to the uh, type theory thing. In modern love type theory, there's a type constructor uh, which associates to every type another type which depends on A, a dependent type. So it's, uh, in other words, for every type A, you can describe a family of types. It's an internal type. So it's actually, it will be given as a map between two things, but the notations in type theory is like that. Given x in A and y in A, there is a type, identity xy. Uh, it's a rather mysterious thing. It's called the identity type of A. Now, an element of that type is regarded as a proof that x and y are equal. That's Martinov <coughs> idea. An element of the identity type is regarded as a as an evidence that x and y are the same. And of course, uh, x is the same as x, so there should be a proof that x is equal to x. And uh, Mertenlove provides an operation, there is a God given operation, or given by Mertenlove, <laughs> that uh, x is equal to x, so there is a special symbol, r. And R of X is uh, giving a proof that X is equal to X. Okay. Now, um, if you uh, sum up all these uh, uh, identity type over X and Y, uh, you will have a projection ST from uh, the identity to A cross A. I call it S and T. Mm -hmm. And you will have uh, a map R, which is actually the reflexivity term. <coughs> and uh, you get the uh, factorizations of the diagonal as a reflexivity <coughs> term followed by ST. And it was observed by uh, Wojtowski, Awodi, and Warren uh, that uh, the, this factorization is actually a path object for A. This was a crucial observation. <laughs> I hope I am correct uh, in the citation. It's, it's not uh, in Wojtowski. It's not in Wojtowski, okay. You learned it from us. Okay, okay. <coughs> so uh, I should maybe remove Wojtowski from this uh, quotation. Uh, Wojtowski had a different insight on what is uh, type theory, but not uh, this one. Not the path. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, it's an amazing observation because type theory is really something constructed by logician, people who would like to do constructive mathematics, programming, proof assistant, things of the sort, they don't uh, do homotopy theory at all. And then suddenly there was a contact between uh, this uh, subject of uh, logic and homotopy theory. Uh, the notions of uh, path object is quite abstract and involved in homotopy theory. And on the other hand, the identity type is also has its own purpose and etc. And these two things turn to be somehow the same. These things don't happen often in mathematics, right? You have 
<coughs> two group of mathematicians working on a very different subject, so different that people actually on this side don't know what's happening on this side, and etc. And then eventually they discover that they are essentially doing the same thing. How is that? <coughs> it, it, there's a kind of philosophical question to ask here, because how could it be possible? Is this a kind of accident? Or is there something deeper in the mind of mathematicians that makes that possible? Right? Okay. I would tend that, yeah, maybe there is something in the human mind and the mind of mathematicians that produce that. It's not, it cannot be a random accident, right? It must be by virtue of some, something deep is going on. But what is it, okay? And somehow, yeah, I, I don't know what it is, okay? Uh, okay, now, uh, then it's possible to actually check that every tribe is a brown fabrician category. You may not know what is a brown fabrician category, but the axioms are there. Uh, it's not too important that uh, I go through the axioms, but uh, it's a standard notion. The brown fabrician category was invented, were invented by uh, Kent uh, Brown in uh, 1970, about maybe 71 or something. Uh, and it happens that tribes uh, are uh, fabrician categories. But they are special kind of Fabrician categories because a Fabrician category is, is it's a clan. You have a class of Fabricians and you have also a class of equivalences. You have two things and you have axioms uh, connecting the two things. Uh, a tribe is different because you start with a class of Fabrician and everything is constructed from the Fabrician. Okay. In a Fabrician category, it's not the case. The class W is relative, the class of equivalence a multiple equivalence is, is kind of uh, relatively independent of the class uh, of fabrication. Anyway, uh, that's a theorem. Now, let's uh, do a little bit of uh, homotopy type theory in action. Given an object in a tribe with internal product, an object A, uh, you can define uh, you can construct a subject called is contractible A. What do you do? You take uh, the uh, identity type, which depends on two variables. You can take a product with respect to the first variable and then a sum over with respect to the second. Okay. Now, the kind of amazing thing is that an element of this object is actually a proof that A is contractible. In other words, it is a contraction. What is a proof that A is contractible? It's, uh, it's actually it's the constructions of a contraction. Okay. So this is uh, uh, actually the collections of all contractions of A is contractible. And it, the, the, the formulas can be compared uh, with uh, the following f formulas, which says that what is a singleton? Is singleton A. A? A is a singleton, means that there exists a Y such so that every X in A is, X is equal to Y. Okay? That's, this sentence here in set theory would say that uh, the set A is a singleton, in the sense that uh, an element, if this is non empty, okay, then uh, A is a single thing. And uh, there is a nice, uh, this is called the Curie Howard correspondence. Mm -hmm. If you replace the summation operation by the existential quantifier and the product by the universal quantifier, uh, and from type theory to uh, ordinary predicate logic, uh, you get the so called Curie Howard correspondence. Uh, in other words, the formulas of type theory, this is a typical formulas of type theory, is contractible A, they can be looked at as some kind of first order formulas, first order logic, where the summation is an existential quantifier and the product is a universal quantifier. 
And actually, Martin Love, this is the way Martin Love was thinking of his type theory. Uh, uh, he was thinking of it as a kind of uh, constructive first order logic. Where the identity type from x to y is like the equality relation, except that it's no longer a relation somehow, it's a type. Okay. Uh, another construction is that if you have a map in a tribe, you can uh, describe the homotopy fiber of f at y, where y is an element of b. Well, the homotopy fiber is like, uh, as usual, uh, x is in the homotopy fiber, and an element x of a is in the homotopy fiber. If you are given a path from uh, f of x, the image of uh, x by f, to y. So the homotopy fiber is this collection of uh, pairs, an element of x in a, an element a x of in a, together with a path from f of x to y. That's the homotopy fiber. OK. Uh, uh, now, Wojewski uh, <coughs> saw that you, you could actually describe homotopy equivalences by saying that the homotopy fibers are contractible. So you want to say that it is contractible. This is something we have uh, constructed before. So you take the product over all y over b. And you're sort of saying that uh, every fiber is contractible okay, in the Curie over the correspondence. So the nice thing about this uh, object is that an element of this object is actually a proof that F is an equivalence. So imagine that you have a map between two spaces. You wonder, is this a homotopy equivalence? Well, there could be many ways to try to solve this question. But what this uh, formula is saying that, well, you can construct a third space from, from this map, which is uh, this space is equivalent. This is a space. This is, OK? And an element of that space will be actually an equivalence, a proof that F is an equivalence. So if by some computation you can construct an element of that space, you will have proof that F is an homotopy equivalence. So this is how type theory is doing. You see, you, you want to prove something, you construct the formulas that describe what you want to prove, and then you make a computation to construct an element of that formulas. And you, you get the proof. What it, OK. So you can, given A and B, construct the space of equivalence between A and B. That's uh, also a definition of Wojewski. <coughs> the space of equivalence between A and B. You, what, what do you, you, you take the sum over all math from A to B of the space is an equivalence F. You see? Um, an element of that space now will be some equivalence between A and B. Okay. So I'm going giving you other objects here. Another object is uh, given a fabrication, you can construct a new object. The formula is there. And what it says is that uh, an element of that space is given by two point x and y in A, together with an equivalence between the fiber of p at x and the fibers of p at y. So that's uh, a new space. And it's uh, not difficult to see that you get a factorization of so the diagonal using this uh, new object where uh, ux here 
the, this map U, is uh, representing the identity map. The identity map from EX to EX is always an equivalence, and therefore you can uh, actually construct it explicitly, and that's produce a map like this, and you have a factorization of the diagonal. <coughs> as well. okay. okay, now let me go to the notions of connection on the fabrication. Now, if you have a fabrication, topologists define a connection uh, on, uh, on, the, on the bundle, for example, if you're a bundle, what is the connections on the bundle? It's a map from the, the path space of A, I write the path space of A as the identity A here, uh, to this uh, space of equivalence that I was describing before. It's a map gamma uh, filling this uh, square. If you look at gamma as a map between two fabrations, because this is a fabrication and this is a fabrication, and you look at what's happening in the fibers, and uh, you get a family of map gamma xy. The family is taking a path from x to y into an equivalent between ex and ey. You see, this is really what the connection is doing. The connection is transforming the paths uh, in the base space into equivalence between the fibers. Okay? And the only condition here is that uh, this path should transform the reflexivity terms, that is the constant path from x to x, into the identity from x to x. This is the commutation of, of gamma with respect to R and U. This is a weak condition on uh, this notion of uh, connection. I call it a pseudo connection because normally for a connection you would ask also that if you compose paths, you will be composing the equivalences, right? That this is this gamma is actually sort of a functor really, because there is a composition of paths and you want to. But uh, actually, at least in the Motsbita theory, this is not important. Uh, the reason is that um, actually uh, there is only one connection. There is one up to homotopy. Every vibration admits a connection. And the connection is actually homotopy unique. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, if there is one which is which respect composition strictly, fine. But uh, anyway, it would be equivalent to any other one not respecting composition. They are all equivalent. Okay. And why, why is that? Why is, is it that uh, every map admits a connection? Well, it comes from this uh, commutative square. It's because it turned out, I mean, because the map R is anodyne, as was observed by uh, uh, Woody and Warren. The map R, reflexivity term, is anodyne. And uh, the map P1, P2 is a fabrication. And so you have a commutative square, one is anodyne, the side is a fabrication, you, there's a diagonal filler, and you can show that the diagonal filler of, uh, uh, is always homotopy unique, I mean, for any anodyne in any fabrication. So, uh, see, this is, I mean, this is very easy to prove, right? Okay, so every fabrication admits a connection. Okay, definition. We say that a fabrication is univalent, that's the definitions of Wojewski, if the connection is actually a multiple equivalence. <coughs> now, to be in a multiple equivalence is equivalent to saying that for each x and y, this map is a multiple equivalence. And also, it's equivalent to say that uh, the unit here uh, of, the, of this uh, object is a multiple equivalence. Mm -hmm. So this is just a definition. Now, why is it interesting? Now, we will come to that in a moment. Uh, and we need the notions of 
small fabrication. It's a bit like uh, notions of a finite set or small set or something like that. Uh, in type theory, there's a there is also a notion of small type. Uh, it's to avoid uh, Russell paradoxes. You, so you, you want to like you would like to take the type of all types, but you cannot because it leads to a contradiction. So you just allowed to take the type of all small types. There is there is a kind of hierarchy between the types and. Uh, and you need uh, to have a notion of small type, or maybe of a small of a small fabrication. Uh, a fabrication is small if the fibers are small. Okay. And there are axioms that you can put on uh, the notions of small fabrications. Every isomorphism is a small fabrication. Uh, the base change of a small fabrication along any map is small, and uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and the more or less uh, obvious things. Uh, the composite of two small fabrications is small, etc., uh, etc. Et For example, in the tribe of Kant complexes, there is a notion of uh, uh, k-small fabrication for every strongly inaccessible cosmos. So, uh, what does it mean? Uh, uh, it means that the fibers of the fabrications um, are S small homotopy types. And small means that uh, an homotopy type is small if it is homotopically equivalent to a uh, simply cell object which is uh, which is uh, a causality smaller than K in some sense. There is a causality. So, small fabrication. Okay. Now, if you have a notion of small fabrications, you uh, can define what is a sort of universal or semi-universal small. So, a small fabrications is semi-universal if for every uh, other small fabrication P, there exists a multiple pullback square. I say multiple pullback rather than pullback, but there are variations about this. Uh, some author maybe would prefer to say there is exists a pullback, but I think I choose to say multiple pullback. Multiple pullback means that the uh, induced map from E into the actual pullback uh, is a multiple equivalent. So you don't uh, want necessarily want this map to be an isomorphism. Okay, and um, it happens that uh, if the semi-universal fabrication is univalent, then uh, the pair, phi phi prime, this is called classifying pair of the fabrication P, is a multiple unique. If you're familiar with the idea of uh, classifying space, let's say for vector bundles, this is uh, very much like the same thing. You see, what I'm saying is that to be a small fabrication is like, is like to be uh, vector bundles. What I'm saying is that you could have that Q is a universal vector bundles in the sense that every other vector bundle will be a pullback of the universal one. And, uh, but there is a question of the unicity of the classifying pair, phi phi prime. I mean, is it true that the map, uh, phi, the pair of maps phi phi prime, which produce that, uh, are they unique? Are they to be unique? And in the theory of classifying space, uh, the pair phi phi prime is a to be unique. And you want the pair phi phi prime to be unique. And Wojewski has observed that if the fabrication is univalent in the sense that I have defined before, then uh, the pair is a multiple unique. Uh, that is, the univalence is what you need uh, to have uniqueness of the classifying map of your um, uh, small fabrications or maybe uh, vector bundles. You see. Uh, this is something which is true also with uh, vector bundles. Uh, the, 
you can define uh, the notions of a univalent vector bundle. You, you use the same uh, idea, and it happens that the universal um, vector bundle, of, let's say, of dimension n, is a univalent uh, object. And now, Martin Love type theory has semi universal fabrication. There are uh, uh, <clears throat> notions of small fabrications in Martin Love type theory, but they are not uh, univalent. The, the, Martin Love had not this idea of having uh, univalent uh, uh, fabrication. <clears throat> So somehow something was missing in matter of type theory, and Wojewski sort of uh, discovered uh, what was the what was missing. Uh, this uh, uniqueness is absolutely essential in uh, uh, in uh, homotopy theory, and so uh, so I'm going to say that uh, a small fabrication is universal. If it is semi-universal and univalent, and then the object, the or Q, uh, could be called a universe in some sense. Uh, it's uh, something. It's a classifying space in some sense. And uh, Wojewski observed. It's not uh, obvious that the tribe of Kant complexes has a universal. K small fabrications for every strongly inaccessible cardinal. So they are there in nature. So if you look at uh, uh, CAM complexes, <coughs> CAM complexes are mod modeling spaces. And, uh, uh, okay. So, okay, now what is univalent type theory? I'm going to say that the univalence principle holds in a tribe if Every fabrication is somehow the homotopy pullback of a univalent fabrication. It's uh, as in the theory of classifying space. Every vector bundle is actually the pullback of the universal vector bundle, which is itself univalent. So uh, this is a very natural axiom. And uh, then we could say that a type theory is univalent uh, if the universal uh, principle, uh, the univalence principle holds in T, if uh, the univalence principle holds in T. So every uh, fabrication is a pullback of a univalent fabrication. How much to be pulled back? Uh, I don't know what time. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I should stop at uh, eight thirty, right? Yeah. Roughly. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. I'm happy to continue. Yeah. I would like to say that looks a, a, a very mysterious. I, I think I, I should say a few things about what is this action. I mean. A fabrication is a family. You have a family of objects indexed by A. Okay. So what happened is that in this family, you may have copies, redundant copies of a certain fiber. Two fibers could be isomorphic or equivalent, although they have different index. So you have a family, but there are repetition in the family. Okay. Well, that's exactly the point. If, if, if you have a repetition, then the family is not univalent. To be univalent means that there is no repetition. You see, so every family, when there are repetitions, you can actually identify two index when they get to the same fiber, when they have the equivalent fiber. So then you are you're compressing the fiber. Mm -hmm. okay? A univalent uh, fibration is like an incompressible family. 
it cannot be compressed. Because each time you have two fibers which are equivalent, then the two index are equal. Equal in the sense of type theory, which means there is a canonical path between the two, which is mirroring the equivalence. Okay? So what this axiom is saying is that every family has if to every family, we can find another one which is incompressible and which is somehow just a change of parameter with respect to the incompressible family. Okay, so, okay. Well, um, uh, there's a lot of things that can be done in a tribe. There is a notion of homotopy Kulevich, which has, uh, it's called a inductive types. It was developed by um, Abudi, Gambino, Sorzakova, and uh, also the contributions of Schulman and uh, Peter Lomsdain, etc. And uh, uh, then there is a notion of uh, homotopy push-out in some sense, because uh, an homotopy push-out is the homotopy co-limit of two objects. So I think I will not be able to tell you the rest uh, we'll leave you the notes. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Here is uh, uh, what is an in elementary infinity torpos? Mm -hmm. So here is a tentative answer. Um, I do not. I, I have no pretension that this is the, the final answer. But you could say that a tribe is an elementary infinity torpos. Uh, First, it must have uh, internal product, and it must have inductive types, although this is not completely clear what it means, because people <laughs> keep exploring the notions of inductive types. And then it should be a univariant type, which means that uh, every fabrication should be the pullback of an incompressible fabrication. Okay. And uh, that's a possible notions of infinite totals, of elementary infinite totals. Now, there are applications that, which I don't have the time to describe. First, the blakers massey theorem, which is a classical theorem in the Motopi theory, was actually proved by a team of four young mathematicians <coughs> Uh, Favonia, Finster, Likata, and Peter Lomsdale. And it's a marvelous proof. The proof is new. And it is, uh, it was reformulated in the language of model category by uh, Charles Red, because I think he wanted to understand it. And uh, the proof is using descent in the language of Charles Rex, I don't have the time to tell you what descent is, uh, but uh, it's, uh, I am still really in admiration with respect to this proof. And uh, I, uh, we studied it with uh, Mathieu Anel Biederman, Eric Fins, and Eric Fister, uh, and we sort of extended it. It's called Generalized Blaker's Massey Theorem. Uh, and uh, with, the, with the goal of applying it to uh, good willy calculus. And uh, it happens that uh, many uh, important uh, basic uh, results of good willy calculus can be proved uh, using follow from the generalized Blaker's Massey theorem. And we have a paper uh, that was just published in the Journal of Topology about that. So I think I don't have the time to tell you more. I, pre I have prepared just too much uh, for, for it. Uh, <coughs> sorry, thank you. I should stop. <laughs> Maybe I would like to go to the very end. You know that uh, Vladimir Vavetsky died uh, a, a year ago, uh, and I hope that his dream of univariant foundation was will be realized uh, as soon as possible. But it could take, <laughs> it could 
take a decade, I don't know, but uh, yeah. You have a notion of you have a notion of equivalence uh, given by the Vygotsky notion of weak equivalence, and so there's a notion in a tribe of a weak uh, equivalent vibration. So you could call it a trivial vibration, and then from that and lifting, you could define your co-vibrations. That, that's true. Don't that's you suppose that once you do that, you could define equivalent model structure? using the rest of the equipment in the tribe, if it's univalent. I, I suppose if you would need something like univalence or a universe, and then I guess you can define a quillet model structure on the tribe, a special one. Uh, well, I, that's a very good observation. So thank you for doing it because uh, uh, this is a line of thought that should be really uh, explored and developed. Maybe you have done something about it. Yeah, I'm glad you say it because that's what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to check first before. Okay, so maybe I want to say one thing is that um, uh, remember that uh, in a tribe, every object is fabric. Yeah, sure. And uh, this is kind of incompatible. Mm with the idea that you will have a, a model structure uh, on, the, on the tribe. You need to introduce uh, objects that are not vibrant mm -hmm. if you want to have a model structure. And I don't know how type theory can be extended to introduce uh, these new objects. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe tomorrow you will yeah, have an answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Jay, yes. I'm sorry, this, this, is, this is too stupid. And please ignore it. Stupid. How could Martin Loff have ever thought that there was only one proof for every two objects of when they're the same? That's impossible. All mathematicians for thousands of years have discussed when are two proofs really the same? That means occasionally there must be two different proofs. So how could he think and formalize? That's all. That there's only one proof that X Well, no, well, in, I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not sure I understand you correctly, but okay. in the modern law system, given two objects, right. there are in general many proofs well, that they are equal, or exactly. And that's, well, exactly the, that's exactly the point of modern law type theory, is that an element. Well, I'm just confused. I don't know. Okay. Well, there are, well uh, uh, this was in his uh, initial system. Ah, he first. Thank you. Describe this system, very nice system, right. but it was kind of complicated because he had no interpretation. He had not the homotopy interpretation. And uh, you could have all kinds of formulas, you didn't know what, what they meant. They were there, but. Uh, and uh, uh, 10 years after, uh, maybe eight years after uh, introducing his type theory, he decided he had a kind of. Break, nervous breakdown, not uh, not uh, not uh, psychologically, but somehow yeah, that this this thing is just too complicated. So he decided that uh, he would impose that there is on, at most one proof that oh. is equal. So he said he told me that this was the biggest mistake of his uh, of his life <laughs> because eight years mistake. after introducing his system, he sort of destroyed it. <laughs> but later, sort of realized that it was uh, an error. But uh, you know, uh, yeah. As a child, the teacher in my arithmetic class gave the assignment to all the students to add up the numbers from one to a hundred. And of course, that's one of the most famous examples of two different uh, proofs. One, you go one, then plus two, then Gauss said one and a hundred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And they're different. They're clearly different. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, but uh, it's kind of uh, in type theory. There is a notion of, uh, of I would say, uh, judgmental equality of of two proof. Uh, in other words, uh, two proof could be uh, uh, different, but for some kind of trivial reason, the, and you should not regard them as as really different because they just differ 
because you you have changed the uh, the bracketing yeah. here in the proof by another kind of bracketing, <coughs> and uh, the proof are the same but except for syntactic reason. So in the matter of that theory, you do identify these proof. The the the, the proof that are uh, sort of equivalent for this kind of trivial reason turns out to be the same. Right. But there are other proofs that are radically different. Yeah. Okay. They cannot be yeah. uh, regarded as as the same uh, for you. some I, kind of deep I didn't reason. I know the history. Thank you. Any further comments? Uh, um, does the space of proofs um, have higher homotopy uh, groups? Yes, of course. Yeah. Because uh, that's something that was uh, discovered uh, by uh, Woody, uh, this interpretation. And now that you have the identity type, you could have two different proofs that x is equal to y. And then you may have a proof uh, that these two different proofs are the same. Okay? But there could be different proofs that these two different proofs are the same. So these are called higher homotopies. They are like homotopies between homotopies, and you could, uh, you have, yeah. So there is a marvelous uh, uh, computations of uh, pi uh, three of uh, S two, for example, the third third homotopy group of the two sphere, uh, which is Z. Uh, just using uh, univalent type theory. Um, the proof is by um, Guillaume Brunnery. Yeah. Yeah. Guillaume. Yeah. So uh, that's the point also of homotopy theory. These axioms that uh, are given by uh, univalent type theory should suffice to is to compute everything you want in homotopy theory, including the homotopy groups of spheres, of course, but uh, much more. So it's really uh, uh, an amazing uh, apothesis, I would say. It's an apothesis because it's not yet done. We, pi 3 of S2 is Z, but there are many uh, other homotopy groups of spheres, and it's not, I don't know if there is a proof that uh, they can all be computed in uh, type theory, but uh, it is expected that they can be computed in type theory, all of them. So it means that uh, eventually we, it will be possible to do topology uh, fully in this system. Uh, I hope so. I mean, uh, there are applications already which are showing that uh, uh, the uh, approach is really uh, giving something. It's a, uh, yeah. Well, uh, so I'll take, if I may, I'll take a stab at your question, how it can be that people from different areas can discover the same thing independently of each other. You suggested maybe it says something about the way that the human mind works. It's, it's similar. I would say a different answer. I would say it's the objectivity of mathematics. <laughs> you're, you're a philosopher, and I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But it's not uh, a physical or you know, material uh, objectivity. It's a different kind. So the, the sense the human mind maybe has an objective reality. Yeah. Yeah, we're all seeing the same thing. Well, shall we? Thank you. Thank you.